Alrighty dudes, what's up? Today I'm bringing you a Mythic Plus VOD review of a Junkyard 21 uh, that I did this week. It is bolstering and Grievous, fortified and awakened. So um, with this run, basically the most optimal way of playing out and playing out this run as a Moonkin will be get the Shock Bot and the Grease Bot as quickly as possible and then have as much haste gear as possible. Uh, this makes the Spark Bot do significantly more damage whenever you do in fact have just like as much haste so you see me i'm running expedient seven basically uh so expedient and racing pulse are both incredibly powerful and with that i did 126,000 dps in this dungeon basically uh in, in addition to that the shock bots also do scale with item level so you can actually see that so we, ha we actually have pre-assigned shock bot locations, and this is my first shock bot. Oh, this is like where I go and get mine. So I get mine off to the side, and then just because it's really easy for me to stealth all the way past that first guy, and then just be able to get around. Um, from there, we're actually pulling the trash like over to this area. We're not pulling the trash, but we're pulling one of the one of the one of the bots over here, and then like basically it allows us to have a decent bloodlust uh, overall. So yeah, that's what we're doing there. You, you see us actually use Bloodlust right here, here in a couple of seconds. I actually tried to press the mallet, but it just didn't go off. Uh, we'll end up reusing Bloodlust in a couple seconds. Um, okay, so there we go. And then, yeah, so basically being just having the most amount of haste with your spark bot is a very critical element to it. If I wanted to do more damage, I probably should have ran Blood of the Enemy Miner as opposed to running Conflict, probably. That's what probably what it was swapped out for Bloody Enemy Miner, just because it will give me more average haste um, generally, which will thus increase my damage done by spark bots. So that that's how that ends up working out. So you see us here, we end up uh, doing that first pack with our Bloodlust, just trying to get it on CD, and then we make our way to Gunker. We need to make sure that we know where the HK8 aerial unit is actually rotating. And on this week, it was over... I believe Trixie and Nano first. So it was over Trixie and Nano first, and then it moves to over Gunker. So we go uh, we go Gunker to Trixie and Nano, then to Gabamac, uh, utilizing some of the portals to be able to move around just a little bit easier. Something else that you probably should notice is that I'm also playing Mass Entangle. Uh, Mass Entangle is probably the best talent on that row. I think it's a little bit better than uh, Typhoon. There, there are some Mass Entangle tricks that you can do, notably on these Slime Elementals, whenever they are casting their Slime Wave, which is their charge, you can root them mid-Slime Wave, and it will cancel it. Also, on HK8, the Walkie Shockies, which are just the biggest nuisance of all time, rooting them in place is fairly strong. So th those, that's the reason I end up running Mass Root. Mass Root is probably, in general, the best talent for this. Thus, with that being said, you probably are also able to play over 40 Corruption in this dungeon if you are feeling comfortable doing it. Um, I don't here, but that is mostly due to the fact that it is Grievous, and Grievous with your eyeball can be a little bit rough. Uh, and by rough, I mean it's just probably not worth dealing with. Um, but you can absolutely play over 40 Corruption in this dungeon, especially if you're running Master Root. That's that's about how I end up feeling about it normally. If you are able to run mass root, you're able to play over forty eight. Or you are able to play over forty corruption. If you're not able to run mass root, um, say the dungeon specifies for for uh, typhoon, such as on sanguine weeks or just dungeon dependent stuff, then there's not like a really logistical way for you to be able to run over forty uh, feasibly. It's, it, it, you're just gonna get hit by a thing from beyond, and basically getting hit by a thing from beyond, especially whenever you're running dungeons, is just like impossible to deal with so you see me right there i actually ended up rooting that slime elemental before the charge ended up going off it also got gouged at the same time which is okay uh so the important thing here no uh, the no meeting slimes they summon these droplets and they all will end up casting this acid spray ability and you you saw me earlier i barked it making sure that you use bark skin whenever those uh, whenever the no meeting slime ends up separating into a a few parts is a really good way for you to be able to mitigate damage. Maybe you use a health potion at that point too to be able to help yourself out a little bit. So now we're dealing with the toxic monstrosity. So a mechanic that's probably not the most well known. Um, this expansion, but was fairly uh, well known last expansion, is how this consume. Like uh, basically, if you're getting like projectile grabbed, 
during it, you can actually like wild charge to cancel out of the projectile grab i know it happened on odin you could actually just like a wild charge to be able to insta negate that cast um and it happens with this toxic monstrosity like how this grab ends up grabbing your character you are able to just wild charge and cancel out of it i'm not going to be able to do it here because i don't have wild charge up yet but that's a really easy way to be able to make sure that you're positioning yourself uh another part was like it was used on the spider in arcway significantly frequently so that's a good way of being able to just like reposition yourself quickly uh simply like the harpooners like with the harpooners and freehold um once they grab you you can just cancel out of that instantly so you see here i already have all three of my bots i have the grease bot the shock bot and the uh, welding bot that's about as good as it's going to get um, we're trying to coordinate who's getting what bot as quickly as possible just to make sure that once we do all have it, all of our bots available then we are in a good position to be able to just like just power through this instance the timer on this dungeon is i think the timer on this dungeon is good the problem with this dungeon is that it's the most free dungeon imaginable if you have everybody with their uh, with their shock bots, or it's absolutely the hardest dungeon possible if you don't. And there's almost zero in between, which is unfortunate, but it, it's just how it works. All right, so you see here, uh, just moving out of the eyeball there. Uh, something that's also pretty nice, I, I do actually like Obsidian Claw in this dungeon. I would probably be playing Vita Charge Titan Shard though if I did have the opportunity to. Uh, Obsidian Claw is good, especially since it does in fact scale with haste, and I am running just a, a absolute ass ton of haste. But I, I do think Vita Charge Titan Shard would help not only myself out more, but it would actually help group damage a significant amount. My trinkets are pretty bad, but my corruption is incredibly strong, so it it really just kind of works itself out. Alrighty, so we're going to be getting down the third Toxic Monstrosity, and once that ends up happening, uh, then it will summon that bot, the cleansing bot that will walk around Gunker whenever we are dealing with Gunker. Uh, we can just kind of skip ahead a little bit. Alright, so now we're just sitting here waiting a couple seconds. Oh, okay, so actually the HK8 area suppression unit starts over Gobamac, not Trixie and Nana, but the point still stands, it goes to Gunker second, so we go to Gunker first, uh, just to be able to get this out of the way. Alright, so we're potioning here. Uh, I don't really have my cooldowns yet, but it's not really that big of a deal. As a ranged DPS on this fight, you'll see your melee is just like walking through this uh, cleansing bot the whole entire time. You should not be doing that as a range. You should just be like... So whenever he does his coalesce or his toxic waste, um, then you should be looking to get into the uh, bot. But if, until then, you don't really have to. Even on the coalesce, you don't have to all the time. Uh, the coalesce is the one that drags the it drags the goop in. So as long as there's nothing, there's nothing behind you, you don't actually need to be in that cleansing bot. If you, if it isn't behind you, then you should be in the cleansing bot. That's a, that's about how that ends up working out. So, but in the toxic waste one, you almost always have to be, um, in it. Otherwise, you can outrange it, but your zap doesn't do damage if you're over forty yards away. So, I would highly advise not doing that. Is basically my my thoughts on the matter. So you see me there, I actually uh, am max haste. I was triple Star-Lord stacked and in cooldowns, and then I ended up using my uh, my Obsidian Claw on the boss. That's basically how you want to use Obsidian Claw. Whenever you're a three stack, whenever you have a three stack of Star-Lord and are in your cooldowns, then you use your Obsidian Claw to be able to get the most benefit out of it. It just does fucking freakish amounts of damage and it scales with haste. So that's that's why I use it the way I use it there. All right, so Gunker's going to be going down here in a couple seconds, and then you're going to see us move our way towards our first obelisk that we're going to be playing in the instance. Um, how we normally end up playing these obelisks is we kill the first, like the front two eyeballs, especially on this on this blob that we're about to play. We're going to kill the front two eyeballs, and then we're going to move to teleport the back two eyeballs away just to not be able to deal with them. We have to wait on this uh, crawler, otherwise we're going to be... Uh, accidentally pulling that which should not be to our benefit because this mob is the most overtuned mob in the instance but okay so you see here we get the blood of the corrupt respond uh, right here we're going to be dpsing down these mindfly tentacles the melee are going to start on the very back couple but they're going to bail on them whenever they end up getting uh the st the puddles on top of them it's just not the most reasonable uh if they if we are able to get them down quick enough 
which we probably are in Junkyard. The reason for that is because of how the, the Shockbots end up working out. But in most other dungeons, we just don't really look to bother with the back couple. We just kind of leave them and let them teleport in, and then we DPS them down. Uh, it, they also target the nearest player. So allowing that to fixate onto your tank is pretty beneficial, especially if they are getting bolstered like that one is currently. With that three stack of bolstering, it can be kind of uh, monka s. So there's there's some ways of being able to deal with it. So now we're dragging the blood of the corruptor. It's at twenty percent health. It's going to get just beat down by our shock bots. So we're just like full running. We we stopped hitting the whole entire mob just because we don't want it to die too early. Because we're going to pull it all the way into this corner area. We believe that the corner area allows us the best path to be able to uh, just deal with this room because there is that patrol that sits in the middle. I think I'm going to. I think I mastered it in this run. I'm not a hundred percent sure. Our warrior comes out just a little bit early, but okay. So yeah, there. I mastered that pack right there. Just because I don't want it. It doesn't patrol all the way into you. Let me, let me pause real quick. So it patrols like here. But I don't want it coming too close and us accidentally pulling it. So I just would rather root it right there. Uh, just to be able to deal with it easier. Alright, so we instantly battle as a warrior. Not really too big of a deal here. We're going to be able to DPS down this pack. There isn't anything that's like too notable inside of this pack. The mechanic needs its overclock and its repair kicked. But beyond that, it's fairly simple pull. The next pull is by far the hardest one, and it's because of these blasters that are that occur inside of the pack. Uh, make, basically, make sure that you target down the blasters, use your cooldowns into them. They are fairly scary. We use we use Ursula's Vortex really early to be able to drag the blasters back in whenever they do cast their first running gun, allowing our melee to have the most uh, the highest amount of damage that they can deal to them. So that's a a nice mechanic. So you can actually see our, our our healer and our deep or melee actually ended up dying to this mine. The mines are actually kind of hard to see. So as a ranged, eh, just kind of uh, be wary of them. Stay far away. You see it right there. There's another mine. Just really try to make sure that you're not standing in melee. They're they're significantly harder to see in melee than in ranged. But it it, it just happens. Like people die to that kind of stuff. It's a really not that surprising. It it sucks though. All right, so now we just have the two mechanics. We ended up killing the blasters as quickly as we possibly could. And now we're there. then we're going to start clearing out parts of the room. Uh, this this blaster double scrap hound pack is going to be our next one. These, these scrap hounds, of course, do have that bork mechanic that can kill you. I don't really know the best way of dealing with it. I mean, maybe you just out you just, you just try to outrange the bork, but there there probably is some solution. Maybe, maybe you just want to get closer to them. It, the problem is that their animation on the Bork cast is so just trash that it's like really hard to see. Let me pause it in a second. So you can actually see this guy casting. He's casting it the other direction. Okay, so here are these small fucking blue particles. Our healer ended up getting hit by it. It's so hard to actually see the Bork animation. And then uh, there's another mine that's in that oil that is also impossible to see. It's just really hard to be able to see what's going on. And I'm probably going to get hit by this Bork because I see it a little bit too little too late. It doesn't do... As long as you don't get hit by, hit by both at the exact same time, it's not really that bad, but uh, ill-advised to get hit by one. Alright, so now we're going to be looking to DPS down this weaponized crawler pack. There is something that you can do with trees to be able to make the first crawler cast like face away with how you taunt him during the... I don't even know what the ability is called. The frontal. I, I don't know what it's called. We'll, we'll see it in a second. The scrap cannon. There we go. Uh, you make him flip around and he will cast the scrap cannon at w the location that you place down your trees. Um, but you have to place it like last millisecond to be able to get that to go off. And then, uh, of course, you just whip it around. It will not hit anybody, saving you a decent amount of damage. It's really good if, if it's right before this, this AoE cast that's going off. I still don't know if this Bloodlust that we're doing as our second Lust of the Dungeon is the best or not. So we're going to be Bloodlusting Trixie and Nano a second. I'm not convinced that it's the best one because of how quick Trixie and Nano are. But uh, we'll end up saying, now we're playing double, another double Blaster pack because we want the Spark Bot that's in that location since we had a couple deaths there. So we're just going to DP, deal with that. Now we're pulling Trixie and Nano. Again, like I said, 59 second boss. The only... Like super useful thing that I could even say about that is that whenever Nano does this like uh, exhaust that you can see right here, if you if you do in fact run out of kicks on Trixie, you you can as a range just be positioning yourself near that exhaust, 
dip into it to be able to cancel the taze cast that's on you um, to make sure that you don't end up getting any of those debuffs. That's why I'm positioning so close to it in case I am going to get shot. I don't end up using it in this run, but it's just food for thought, right? So make sure that you kill Trixie and Nano evenly to not empower one of them. If they're empowered, then you're probably going to wipe. If they're not, then you're hard chilling. Yeah, so again, these bosses are definitely not balanced for you to be able to be uh, doing group-wide, like, 700,000 DPS for a minute, and thus they end up just flopping fairly quickly. So that was a pretty swift kill by us. Now we end up dealing with both of these scrap bots. We're probably going to grab the malfunctioning one as well. These are toxic, toxic mobs. Uh, just because of how the exhaust, that smoke bomb style mechanic ends up working out. Dodge out of these red circles, you're probably hard chilling. And then we're going to be looking to do another uh, bunch of grunters with a bully. So with the bully and the grunters, uh, you do have one high health mob, which is that bully to be able to cleave off of here. And so you should, if you are looking to play Moonkin here, you should just like target the bully, start Lunar Striking and Solar Wrathing off of him and that allows you the most amount of damage. The Grunchers do not have a threat table, they just fixate onto you. So Bark Scanning using Engineering Belt, super early. This is also a good use of Typhoon to be able to get the mobs off of you, and then just make sure that you're always looking at that bully to be able to dodge out of the way of the Shockwave. Um, that's fairly nice. So Squishy here does something that's actually really smart with how Spirit Breaker ends up working out. Uh, so he delays the Spirit Breaker until a second before he'll end up queuing up the Dark Fury. So if we eat this first Spirit Breaker, the boss will then immediately begin casting that Dark Fury to allow him to have his debuff like close to resetting to where he's not taking those empowered melees. That That is actually a very important part of how you should be tanking Urgoth Breaker of Heroes at, just as a tank. Uh, it, it allows you just the most amount of damage to be able to mitigate. So now we're moving Urgroth into this corner area to allow us to pull Gaba Max room safer. I'm going to probably be looking to trees the next cast of that Spirit Breaker ability just because it, it will mitigate some damage and we do already have Urgroth in position to be able to be able uh, be taken care of fairly easy. So he goes down, not too much to say about it. Now we're just going to be dealing with Gaba Max room. All right, so this is like the the scrap bot plus trash tosser pack just honestly just really focus on that scrap bot not dying to those red swirlies that are on the ground the trash tossers don't do too ter too terribly much on their own so i mean the trash tossers can be kind of annoying especially if they do leap far out of melee range like this one is right here not exactly the most daunting mob though so just D dps down those then you have double bully which is please don't get hit by shockwave uh if if you're running too much corruption here, it can be kind of annoying. Make sure that you shapeshift off like the corruption slow or something like that. But that's all the mobs that you actually need to get around the Gabamac area. And we're gonna talk about why in a second. You can see that there are some grunters that are free count off to the side still, but we're going to DPS them down with the boss, even though it is bolstering. The grunters don't bolster other mobs. And so this robot right here is activated by the the Tesla. I don't actually know the ability's name. Um, charge smash or whatever the Tesla the thing that you actually end up using to charge the Teslas you can activate this robot and whenever this robot is activated you can pull some of the grunters that are off to the side and with that the robot will actually kill those grunters for you and give you the count for them as long as you do in fact have the tag on them so that's a really easy way to just get a little bit of free count in a way that is able to deal with. So you see me, I'm grabbing these grunters off to the side. I'm really making sure not to pull this malfunctioning scrap bot. So I grab all those grunters here, I dot them all up, and then here comes our robot. Our robot is now just killing all of them, and you see our count going up here onto the side. We end up getting, I don't know, was that like six count for that? So what is effectively, would have been like a, one additional pull. We're just utilizing uh, the Gabamac time and that robot on Gabamac to be able to deal with those easier. So, so now we're just dealing with this. There is a really nasty overlap with the rumble plus the charge smash. We don't end up getting that on fortified levels. I believe it is the fourth charge smash that you end up getting. It overlaps with a rumble pretty hard. So saving a cooldown, saving a personal for that is probably useful. But in this level of key, like on a, on a twenty one, it's not it's not like really a fortified thing, right? That's a, that's like more of a tyrannical problem, not necessarily a fortified problem. All right, so we hit the portal again. We're going back. 
into the Trixie Nano area. We're coming out here. Uh, now we're looking to position ourselves. We're going through the Cat Island area, really making sure that we hug the like the right here to not be able to pull those. We also end up utilizing Shroud there in a couple seconds as well. After we deal, deal with this Blaster double, double Scrapper pack, we just need this pack for count. We, we pace our Trixie Nano room based on when our cooldowns are up. So sometimes we end up pulling this pack, depends on what we actually do have available and depends on like how the room is going. So sometimes this pack gets pulled before the boss, sometimes we get it on our way back out. Generally though, it doesn't really matter too terribly much. It, it just kinda, it's just kinda whatever. So uh, something else that's probably useful is you can actually Demon Hunter Spectral side out the, the cats that are in stealth. I don't know if we necessarily even have to. We don't We don't actually because we're just shrouding all the way through here. So we walk all the way up this right side. The cats patrol through this like lane area. So just as long as you are shrouded slash stealthed and you walk through that like really narrow area, you're not in any danger of pulling the cats. Now we do a, uh, now we do a double pull here, even though it's a bolstering setting. It's normally not the, the most dangerous thing here to do uh, a decent amount of these mobs here. If it were a non-bolstering setting, I would almost recommend just pull the whole fucking thing. Like, like even the three plus that other three pack, just like pull the whole entire thing, whatever equates to like a, almost a 12 mob pull. Maybe it's like a 11 or something. Um, just pull the whole thing. It really doesn't matter. Your, your tank is going to be taking some damage, but as long as you get like the coil bearers pulled... Especially with like trees and solar beam, that pull is mega mega free as long as everybody does have their robots. Honestly, the name of the game for Junkyard is making sure that everybody does in fact have those robots for them. And like I was saying earlier, the dungeon is like one of those things that if you do, if everybody does have their robots for the whole entire duration of the dungeon, you can two chest a fucking like 23 or a 24. And if you don't, then it's uh, probably one of the hardest dungeons to be able to time like period. Just like zone out and may as well try again. Andy Brew, I saw, actually timed to 26 of this dungeon earlier today. So it's like, the dungeon is very easy as long as you make sure that you maintain your spark bots through the whole entire uh, duration of the instance. And you see me doing that there. I ended up not dying. Even if you do die, th the location for spark bots is fairly lenient, especially if you do start in that Gunker area and then make your way to Trixie Nano. There is a lot of extra bots in that area. So making sure that you do have them available to you and available at your disposal is really nice. Sam Wreck Beckner Chaos, the most dangerous part of him are these ravenous flesh fiends. So DPS or like using trees really early and then just letting your melee DPS cleave down this flesh fiends is in your best interest. It keeps your tank stacks low of that, that bleed that is pretty dangerous to him. Because in addition to that bleed, Sam Wreck does also melee pretty hard. So we actually end up killing Sam Wreck here because of where our count ends up lying. Um, we also do have, uh, so we're going to pull both of these cavalry packs. Generally with the cavalry, I would recommend uh, just targeting that mob. He'll, he actually only casts that charge ability if, if uh, there is a target that is outside of 10 yards away. So you don't have to, you actually don't have to deal with that charge if you're, if you're being smart about it. I was talking to our warrior about picking up a bot and was marking it with a world marker so it was a little bit late on that so that charge ended up going off rapid fire also always faces your tank so just keep the cavalry charge uh, targeted no relative where your tank relatively where your tank is and you should be able to deal with that fairly easily um that's that's how the cavalry ends up working out so the cavalry is definitely going to charge out here and i'm just going to be calling it out it'll be like char charge is going off Make sure that you're facing, like, we're going to have the tank always facing this direction towards the boss entrance so that everybody is 100% aware of where the tank is going to be pointing all of the mobs and everything else. So now we're DPSing down this cavalry pack. We're just cleaving off of him because he is the highest health target in this whole entire pack. Making sure that we kick the enlarge slash shrink cast. If, a, if one of them has to go off, it should be the shrink and probably not the enlarge. And then you just uh, dispel the shrink. You can purge off the enlarge. But that puts your tank at a position to where he could potentially die. It is good for a mage if you do have that enlarge on a target. Like, they can spell steal the enlarge for a significant damage increase. But I don't, I don't think I've seen anybody utilize that to its fullest potential yet. So it's hard to really say. So on some weeks, util using Bloodlust on this tank buster could be beneficial. Especially on like really high tyrannical keys. 
Generally, I think you're just going to want to bloodlust during the intermission phase just to ensure that you are going to one phase the boss as that is a, a significant time save. So here we're actually just DPSing down Vo Void River Mouth here. We're going to be cleaving off of the tank buster. Basically, nobody's using their cooldowns here. It's just going to be all, like everything is just going to be passively cleaved down. So you see here, I single root one of the walkie shockies. I mass root the other two walkie shockies together to be able to give us the most amount of room available. Uh, Void Weaver Malthir is going to be dying here in just a couple seconds. And then we're just going to focus our efforts into the tank buster. Making sure that I pers I should have personaled this. Like I should have personaled it before the initial hit. Uh, but I took the initial hit and then personaled after. It's better than not personaling at all, like using Barkskin at all, but um, it that that mechanic, like that arc can be dangerous on higher levels. So you see here, we actually do have this far side run that we have to do. Um, I'm just going to wait for my wild charge to come back up. I used it for something. So I wait for wild charge to come up, and then I wait for this uh, blue zone to go away. And then once it ends up going away, then I'm able to wild charge over these these things you can actually just jump over them normally i was being a bit of an idiot and uh trolled myself there so it, patience is normally better with this with this gauntlet run so you actually just see me jumping over those things normally the the channel is almost all done already though which is like and then i'm like really late getting to the boss because i was stupid Th that that whole thing that I just did right there was really fucking bad, by the way. I would absolutely not recommend mimicking that. So you see me here. Now I'm popping all my cooldowns. I have the Obsidian Claw ready. I use my trees here. I'm using my using everything to be able to just do as much damage. We use Bloodlust. And now we're DPSing down into HK8, Area of a Suppression Unit. And with him going down, we are going to be two-chesting this dungeon. Um, and I'll end up at like 126k DPS overall for the whole entire dungeon, thanks to Shockbots. Uh, let's see, what, what, what exactly was it? Yeah, so 126, I just like barely beat out the warrior that died like a bunch of times, but it was a good run for me. It was one of my better ones, just making sure that you do have a bunch of haste gear, race and pulse and speeding or what you're looking for. That's always good. Um, I've been streaming a lot lately. I've been streaming a lot of my live key sessions. So make sure to check those down, out, down in the description. Uh, if you have any questions, you can hit me up on Discord. Also check out my Patreon. Check out Titanforge Podcast. We do that on a weekly basis as well. Beyond that... I should have another Moonkin Monthly coming out soonish. I'll need to record that soon. I hope you guys enjoyed the VOD review. I'll see you guys later. Peace.